Part 1 You will hear a man, Martin Hill, phoning an estate agent in order to find some accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, Brindle's estate agent's here. How may I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm ringing to see what flats you have for rent at the moment. Right. Can I start by just taking your name, Mr... Um... Hill. Martin Hill. Right. And are you looking for a flat for yourself or um, a family, perhaps? Well, it's for three of us. Myself and two friends. We're going to share together. I see. Um, what about employment? Are you all students? Oh, no. We've all got full-time jobs. Two of us work in the central bank. That's Chris and me. And Phil, that's the other one is working for Hallam Cars, you know, at the factory about two miles out of town. I'll put you down as young professionals then. And I suppose you'll be looking for somewhere with three bedrooms? Yeah, at least three. But actually, we'd rather have a fourth room as well, if we can afford it, for friends staying over and stuff. Is that with a living room to share, plus kitchen and bathroom? Yeah, that sounds good. But we must have a bathroom with a shower. We don't mind about having a bath, but the shower's crucial. Okay. I'll just key that in. And are you interested in any particular area? Well, the city centre would be good for me and Chris, so that's our first preference. But we'd consider anything in the west suburbs as well, really. Actually, for Phil, that'd be better, but <laughs> he knows he's outnumbered. <laughs> but we aren't interested in the north or the east of the city. OK. I'm just getting up all the flats on our books. Now you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Just looking at this list here, I'm afraid there are only two that might interest you. Do you want the details? OK, let me just grab a pen and some paper. Fire away. This first one I'm looking at is in Bridge Street and very close to the bus station. It's not often that flats in that area come up for rent. This one's got three bedrooms, a bathroom and kitchen, of course, and a very big living room. That sounds a good size for you. Hmm. So, what about the rent? How much is it a month? The good news is that it's only £450 a month. Rents in that area usually reach up to 650 a month. But the landlord obviously wants to get a tenant quickly. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a bargain. What about transport for Phil? Well, there'll be plenty of buses, so no problem for him to use public transport. Uh... But unfortunately, there isn't a shower in the flat. And that location is likely to be noisy, of course. OK. What about the other place? Let's see. Oh, yes. Well, this one is in a really nice location, on Hills Avenue. I'm sure you know it. 
This looks like something a bit special. It's got four big bedrooms and, um, there's a big living room. And, oh, this will be good for you, a dining room. It sounds enormous, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds great. That whole area is being developed. And the flat's very modern, which I'm sure you'll like. It's got good facilities, including your shower. And, of course, it's going to be quiet, especially compared with the other place. Better and better. But I'll bet it's expensive, especially if it's in that trendy area beside the park. Mm, I'm afraid so. They're asking £800 a month for it. Whoa. It sounds a lot more than we can afford. Well, maybe you could get somebody else to move in, too. I'll tell you what. Give me your address and I can send you all the details and photos. And you can see whether these two are worth a visit. Thanks. That would be really helpful. My address is flat five. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a tour guide welcoming a group of visitors to the British Library and telling them about the library and what they will see there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. OK? Thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library, and you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St. John Wilson in 1977 and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense and the basements alone have 300 kilometres of shelving and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is 100,000 square metres and, as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces. And it has a thousand staff members based here in the building. So, you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. 
The different items come from every continent and span almost 3,000 years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. So it's really a huge reference library for that purpose. And anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement, where you'll find the cloakroom, and to the left of that, we have the information desk where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours, and anything you need to know, if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor, we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the King. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one, so we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor, and in the right-hand corner you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section, and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two geography students talking. An older student, called Howard, is giving advice to a younger student, called Joanne, on writing her dissertation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year. Yeah, before my first tutorial, I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but... It's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change and it was that that really fired me up. Mm. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library, far better. And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters? Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. OK. Now, I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me, then. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's what suits you, you know, your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library, mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. Maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. Borrowing books from other libraries. But I've heard it isn't all that reliable. Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out 15 instead of the usual 10 books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do. But I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh, yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Dr Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month. Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah. But 
I suppose I can get a lot of support from course mates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think better see how that works out, what the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. OK. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecturer's introduction to a geography module. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, welcome to your introductory geography lecture. We'll begin with some basics. Firstly, what do we learn by studying geography? Well, we learn a great deal about all the processes that have affected and that continue to affect the Earth's surface. But we learn far more than that because studying geography also informs us about the different kinds of relationships that develop between a particular environment and the people that live there. OK, we like to think of geography as having two main branches. There's the study of the nature of our planet, its physical features, what it actually looks like, and then there's the study of the ways in which we choose to live and of the impact of those on our planet. Our current use of carbon fuels is a good example of that. But there are more specific study areas to consider too, and we'll be looking at each of these in turn throughout the semester. These include biophysical geography, by which I mean the study of the natural environment and all its living things. Then there's topography. That looks at the shapes of the land and oceans. There's the study of political geography and social geography too, of course, which is the study of communities of people. We have economic geography, in which we examine all kinds of resources and their use, agriculture, for example. Next comes historical geography, the understanding of how people and their environments and the ways they interact have changed over a period of time. And urban geography, an aspect I'm particularly interested in, which takes as its focus the location of cities, the services that those cities provide, and migration of people to and from such cities. And lastly, we have cartography. That's the art and science of map making, 
you'll be doing a lot of that. So, to summarise before we continue, we now have our key answer. Studying this subject is important because without geographical knowledge, we would know very little about our surroundings and we wouldn't be able to identify all the problems that relate to them. So, by definition, we wouldn't be in an informed position to work out how to solve any of them. OK, now for some practicalities. What do geographers actually do? Well, we collect data to begin with. You'll be doing a lot of that on your first field trip. How do we do this? There are several means. We might, for example, conduct a census, count a population in a given area, perhaps. We also need images of the Earth's surface, which we can produce by means of computer generation technology or with the help of satellite relays. We've come a very long way from the early exploration of the world by sailing ships, when geographers only had pens and paper at their disposal. After we've gathered our information, we must analyse it. We need to look for patterns, most commonly those of causes and consequences. This kind of information helps us to predict and resolve problems that could affect the world we live in. But we don't keep all this information confidential. We then need to publish our findings so that other people can access it and be informed by it. And one way in which this information can be published is in the form of maps. You'll all have used one at some stage of your life already. Let's consider the benefits of maps from a geographer's perspective. Maps can be folded and put in a pocket and can provide a great store of reference when they're collected into an atlas. They can depict the physical features of the entire planet if necessary, or just a small part of it in much greater detail. But there is a drawback. You can't exactly replicate something that is three-dimensional, like our planet, on a flat piece of paper, because paper has only two dimensions. And that means there'll always be a certain degree of distortion on a map. It can't be avoided. We can also use aerial photographs, pictures taken by cameras at high altitude above the Earth. These are great for showing all kinds of geographical features that are not easy to see from the ground. You can easily illustrate areas of diseased trees or how much traffic is on the roads at a given time or information about deep seabeds, for example. Then there are Landsats. These are satellites that circle the Earth and transmit visual information to computers at receiving stations. They circle the Earth several times a day and can provide a mass of information. You'll all be familiar with the information they give us about the weather, for example. So, what we're going to do now is look at a short presentation in which you'll see all these tools... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. IELTS Speaking Tips and Tricks The IELTS Speaking Test assesses your ability to communicate fluently and effectively in English. Here are some tips and tricks to help you excel. General Tips Practice regularly. The more you speak English, the more confident and fluent you will become. Record yourself. This helps you identify areas for improvement, such as pronunciation, fluency, 
and vocabulary. Expand your vocabulary. Learn new words and phrases related to various topics. Develop your grammar. Focus on accurate grammar usage. Be confident. Positive body language and a confident demeanor can make a difference. Listen carefully. Pay attention to the examiner's questions and respond directly. Specific tips for each part. Part 1. Introduction and interview. Be prepared. Practice answering common questions about yourself, your hometown, work, studies, hobbies, etc. Speak naturally. Avoid memorized answers. Expand your answers. Give detailed and informative responses. Part 2. Individual long term. Structure your speech. Use a clear introduction, body, and conclusion. Use linking words. Connect your ideas smoothly. Practice time management. Aim to speak for one to two minutes. Use a variety of language. Demonstrate your vocabulary and grammar skills. Part 3. Two-way discussion. Give opinions. Express your views clearly and confidently. Justify your answers. Explain your reasons for your opinions. Use speculative language. Talk about possibilities and hypothetical situations. Ask clarifying questions. If you don't understand a question, politely ask for clarification. Additional tips focus on fluency and coherence. Speak smoothly and logically. Use a range of language. Demonstrate your vocabulary and grammar skills. Be yourself. Authenticity is key. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Focus on continuing to speak. Remember, practice is essential. The more you practice, the more confident and fluent you will become. Would you like to practice answering some common IELTS speaking questions? I can also provide you with sample answers and feedback. Would you like to focus on a specific part of the test or a particular skill?